I'm here as part of my vocational discernment process and to see how preaching might fit into that. A few weeks ago, I attended a retreat put on by the Episcopal Diocese of Virginia with seven other men and women who are trying to determine whether God is calling us to ordained ministry. It was a wonderful, inspiring weekend in which we talked, laughed, cried, prayed, and ate a lot of really good food. At the end of one day, I went up to my room to check the news I'd missed. That was a mistake. On the top of the Washington Post website was the headline, on the campaign trail, many see a civil war. The retreat I was attending was at Richmond Hill, located in the center of Richmond, which of course was the capital of the South during the actual Civil War. Richmond Hill was showing an exhibit about the lives of slaves and their enslavers in the area. It also talked about what life was like for former slaves after their emancipation, showing newspaper ads many placed looking for their loved ones. One began, Dear Editor, I wish to inquire about my people. I left them in a trailer yard in Alexandria with a Mr. Franklin. They were to be sent to New Orleans. There were mothers looking for daughters, sisters searching for one another. It was heartbreaking. So why would Jesus want to sow division rather than bring peace and divide families as he says, father against son, mother against daughter, and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. Why would the Jesus who we think of as the Prince of Peace go so wildly off script? A little bit of context would be helpful. At the beginning of this chapter in Luke, we know that Jesus is addressing a crowd of thousands of people. The Pharisees are there trying to entrap him for some of the things he's saying, Jesus is reminding his disciples of the need to hold fast to their beliefs. Be watchful and faithful, he tells them, warning them to be dressed for action and have their lamps lit. The Son of Man, he says, is coming at an unexpected hour. This week, Jesus builds upon that theme. He has come to purify or justify the world, that's the fire in the text, but says it is not kindling or catching on with everyone. This is a time of high stress for Jesus. We know, and he knows, that he has a limited time to deliver his message. As a result, he can't afford to mince words. Jesus, of course, doesn't desire to sow division for division's sake. That's not his MO. But things simply can't continue the way they are if God's new way of love is to enter the world. There will have to be a dividing line between those who want to keep things the way they are and those who are ready to accept God's invitation to a new way of being. Because this radical way of love, this turning things upside down, is such a revolutionary idea there are going to be divisions between friends, among family members. It's necessary and it's unavoidable. Of course, not everyone is happy to hear Jesus' message, especially the people who benefit from the system the way it is. They may be experts at interpreting changes in the weather, but not at interpreting signs of how the world is about to change. Those who do hear Jesus' call and respond to it will be going against the status quo, which is a risky, courageous, really, really hard thing to do. As biblical scholar Justo Gonzalez writes, it is as if in a parade some begin marching to a different tune. The rest, those who march to the common tune, will accuse them of upsetting the parade and will seek to suppress or oust them. We, of course, see division so much in our daily lives now. We don't need any help sowing it. People of different political persuasions watch different TV channels, shop at different stores, and even have different facts. 
if you have been able to talk politics with members of your extended family without having voices raised or the conversation end abruptly, count yourself lucky. We see division in the church as well. It's been nearly 20 years since Jean Robinson, the first openly gay bishop, was elected and consecrated in the Episcopal Church. But the issue of same-sex marriage continues to split the worldwide Anglican communion, as we saw at the recent Lambeth Conference in England. Times of division can be uncomfortable places to be. They can lead to hurt, confusion, frustration, and anger. It just doesn't make sense when people who we know so well and love so deeply can disagree with us so much. But division also offers us the opportunity to be honest with ourselves, to deepen our thinking, and to grow closer to God. It can give us pause to stop and ask, how strongly do I feel about this issue? Why? How does it fit into my values? How does it fit into God's values? If we go to the next line in Luke after today's gospel reading ends, we hear Jesus ask, why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? As Gonzalez notes, faithful Christians do not agree on every course of action. We each and all must take the risk of acting according to what we believe to be God's will. We need to use these times of division, which don't appear to be abating anytime soon, to reach out to God, to reflect, and then to act on his vision of transformative love in the world, even if it comes at a cost. How can our hearts, our minds, our actions be more inclusive, more giving, more forgiving? How are we being called to be more loving toward God, our neighbors, and ourselves? If we are following God's will, if we are listening to his voice above the din of the crowds, if we are living God's way and not just the present way, we will not be divided, but whole. We will be living out the new way of love that Jesus is promising to those ready to hear it. And while we may pay a price for not doing things the way we've always done them, and by disagreeing with those around us, we will know that we are actively working to create God's dream of love for all on earth. For God's love never seeks to divide us, but to make us one. Maybe Jesus wasn't so off script after all.